These two cousins from the Black and Caspian Seas have hitchhiked their way from Europe to the U.S., zapping every ounce of food energy from whatever water source they inhabit. These filter-feeding fanatics can be found in lakes and rivers all across the United States. The zebra and quagga mussels are just one more enemy in this daily battle with the silent invaders. There's something therapeutic about the sounds of water splashing against the shore of beautiful Lake Superior. But all is not well beneath these tranquil waves. Just outside the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth, Minnesota, Doug Jensen uses a makeshift device to do a little unconventional fishing for an invasive species that has found a home here. And we'll see if this works. Doug slides his homemade trap up the side of the sheet pilings, carefully raising it from the depths of the lake. We have one. His prey is a small shelled creature that stuck itself to the side of the pilings. This is a zebra mussel, which in and of itself looks pretty harmless. It's not just one zebra mussel that causes the problem. It's when we have millions and millions of zebra mussels on the bottoms of our lakes and rivers that are causing the problem. And there are millions even more. The zebra mussel, and especially its cousin, the quagga mussel, have spread from the Great Lakes region like a virus and is now found across the country. It's about preventing these things from getting into our lakes and rivers because once they're there, we just can't get rid of them. Doug Jensen is one of six experts who will help tell the incredible story of how one small creature is having such a devastating effect on so many bodies of fresh water. Dan Malloy is a research scientist at the New York State Museum in Albany. They can change the ecosystem in ways you don't want the ecosystem changed. Dr. Russell Kuhl is a research scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Great Lakes Water Institute. There are undoubtedly many more individual quagga mussels than there are individual fish. Byron Carnes is an aquatic biologist at the National Park Service on the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway along the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Fish species that used to be prevalent in Lake Michigan are gone. Jeff Weborg fishes Lake Michigan for a living. We don't know if we're going to be in business from one year to the next. Ed Rutherford is a research fishery biologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We don't have oil spills in the Great Lakes, but we have something just as serious, which is invasive species. And Tom Nalepa is also a research biologist at NOAA. I never would expect an organism to become so abundant so quickly and have such dramatic changes as we have seen. The first zebra mussel in North America was found in 1988 in Lake St. Clair near Detroit. From there, they expanded eastward to Lake Ontario and into the St. Lawrence Seaway. The quagga mussel was discovered one year later in 1989. The theory is that both species of mussels hitchhiked a ride from Eastern Europe by living in the ballast waters of giant ocean-going ships. Once here, the zebra mussel quickly spread by the millions throughout the Great Lakes. The quagga, however, took its time, eventually muscling in on the zebra mussel's territory and is now the dominant invasive in unthinkable numbers. There are tremendous numbers of quaggas in Lake Michigan right now. It's uh, Hard to imagine, but uh, our scientist at NOAA who studies life on the bottom has estimated that there are over four quadrillion mussels on the bottom of the lake. Jeff Weborg's fishing business on Lake Michigan near Gills Rock, Wisconsin offers visual evidence of just one of the serious problems created by the enormous population of zebra and quagga mussels. As he releases gill nets out the back of his fishing tug, massive numbers of zebra and quagga mussels drop to the deck like hailstones. The mess they create speaks for itself. It would be great to see them disappear, but that's not going to happen. Uh, they have just they're here and they're here to stay. And so now you, you figure out how to deal with them. But the real mess these mussels create is with the ecology of the lake, especially since the quagga mussel has arrived. 
where we had zebra mussels in kind of restricted areas in warmer water regions, now we have quagga mussels in both warmer water regions and in um, uh, deeper cold water regions. In other words, they're everywhere. Coming up, how quagga mussels are devastating Lake Michigan's food web, starving the fish. Plus, the destruction these underwater animals are creating is costing millions. And wait till you see what researchers at this little lab in the woods in New York State have come up with to rage a war against these invasive mussels. Silent Invaders is a production of the North American Media Group in cooperation with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and by the USDA Forest Service, Wildlife Forever, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and these other organizations. Invasive mussels are affecting the Great Lakes in ways never before experienced or even imagined. I would say that there has not been a component of the food web of the Great Lakes that has not been affected one way or another by what the zebra mussels and now the quagga mussels have done. So the suggestion is that the quagga mussels are eating the food that that many pounds of bait fish uh, would have eaten and therefore short-circuited the food web. The quagga mussels are not only destroying the food web needed for an abundance of game fish, they are changing the entire underwater ecosystem. Here's how. You're going to have two tubes that stick out. One is called the inhalant siphon, and the other one is called the exhalant siphon. Like other species of mussels, the quagga feeds by sucking in water that contains nutritious plankton and then expelling filtered water. The plankton is a critical part of the food chain, and the quagga mussel has a voracious appetite. For centuries, the plankton population of Lake Michigan had been dominated by something called diatoms. Which are large algae, we call them the juicy steak of the food web. A nutritious food source for tiny animals called zooplankton. Zooplankton is consumed by small prey fish like perch, alewives, and chubs, which are eaten by larger fish like lake trout, salmon, and walleye. So as the populations of mussels increased, the amount of the large juicy algae has decreased significantly. What's left are tiny, tiny algae, we call them the sunflower seeds in the shell, which are also nutritious but very difficult to eat because they're very small. The lack of diatoms at the bottom of the food chain has seriously affected the health, size, and numbers of fish at the top of the food chain. The invasive mussels constantly filter the water, leaving less food or energy in the upper water column where the fish eat, bringing what little energy is left to the bottom. In essence, turning the lake upside down. Jeff Weborg is a fourth generation fisherman from Gills Rock, Wisconsin, on the shores of Lake Michigan. It's become very difficult to, to really invest in a business anymore because you don't really have a the idea if you're going to be able to keep on fishing. He says diaporea, or freshwater shrimp, a food staple for whitefish, has virtually disappeared from the lake. And so as a consequence, the whitefish have switched from eating those to whatever they can get. Including the quagga mussels, which are difficult to digest and have little nutritional value. Today, because zebra mussels are stripping out the food sources for whitefish, the whitefish are much smaller, the, they're emaciated, their stomachs are shrunk in. They're still there, they're still alive, but the growth rates are slower and the reproduction is less. 20% of the world's fresh water is right here. Uh, and you can see, you may see all these boats out here, they're harvesting salmon. That's a several billion dollar sports fishery that depends on a healthy food web. Uh, the state of Michigan has, for instance, has decreased their uh, salmon stocking uh, by 50%, mainly because there's nothing for them, those fish to feed on. And the rate at which the quaggas can steal the food from a water column is staggering. Dr. Russell Cool has filled two beakers with lake water, abundant with plankton. He's also added a few quagga mussels to just the beaker on the right. In just 11 minutes, the quaggas have completely cleared the water of nutritious algae. Imagine what quadrillions of quaggas are doing to the Great Lakes food web. If you just put your hand in the water up to your wrist, you couldn't see your fingers. 
Uh, this was a year before muscles got in. And a year after, you could, you could see the bottom in, in, in 20 feet of water. That's how quickly it happened. A zebra mussel the size of my thumb can filter a liter or roughly a quart of water a day. And that's why when they come into lakes, the water typically becomes clearer. Now, a lot of people like that. Oh, look at the water's clearer. It can turn into bad news quickly. Not only does clear water indicate there's little or no food for the fish, it also means that sunlight can penetrate deeper into the lake. That means lots of unwanted aquatic plants, better known as weeds. Coming up, they attach themselves to everything, creating some very sticky situations and costing native mussels their lives. Plus, researchers in New York may have discovered a silver bullet in the fight to control zebra and quagga mussels. With its diesel engine rumbling, the Laurentian treks out onto Lake Michigan to gather more evidence on how the changing environment in the lake is affecting its fish. This is a research boat operated by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're trying to understand how the quagga and zebra mussels, filtration of the water and depletion of the, the phytoplankton has affected the food for larval fish. As they dragged large plankton nets through the water, capturing samples of larval fish, they also pull in another threat to the lake's ecosystem the spiny water flea. That's another unintended consequence of the zebra mussel invasion, the quagga mussels. They clear the water up so much that these, these guys are visual predators, so now they're better able to see the native uh, zooplankton and feed on them. The Laurentian also drags a trowel along the bottom of the lake, scraping up samples of quagga to study in their lab. Quagga mussels now cover the floor of Lake Michigan like a carpet, even in its deepest sections. Oh, we're gonna bring it in, Steve. <laughs> it's quite a haul. And a beer can, look at that. This is just an old beer can, but zebra and quagga mussels have what's called bissel threads that stick like glue to any hard surface under the water. The zebra mussels have this ability to attach, and I'll try to pull off uh, one of the mussels here, you can see that it's, it's pretty difficult for me to, to pull this off. Byron Carnes is an aquatic biologist with the National Park Service. His territory includes the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. The St. Croix is 252 miles long and separates Minnesota from Wisconsin. There are over 40 species of native mussels here. Many have been around for hundreds of years and live to be 40 to 80 years old. Some are on the verge of extinction. One of the things about zebra mussels that, we, that was well understood in the early 1990s was how detrimental they could be to native mussels and other aquatic life. 23 miles of this river are infested with zebra mussels that because of their bissel threads pose a deadly threat to the native mussels. This is a Higgins eye mussel, which is an endangered species with the invasive zebra mussels on it. That native mussel is going to have an incredibly hard time opening and closing its shell, being able to breathe or reproduce or move up and down in the, in the sand like it needs to to survive. And that's eventually what's gonna cause that mussel to decline, to die, uh, to, to certainly not, not do very well. Zebra and quagga mussels are sticking to other things too. So if you take a look at a pipe that mussels have entered, now you've got a problem. Industrial pipes and machinery often get clogged with massive amounts of these invasive species. Right now, it's probably between 15 and 20 million a year to control them at the pipes. If you're turning on your water, you're turning on your lights, you're using electricity, basically we're paying for that in one way or another. The use of toxic chemicals are needed to control mussels, but that may be changing. See this? This mixture represents the first environmentally safe option for zebra and quagga mussel control in North America, and our lab discovered it. At the end of this narrow road in upstate New York are a series of white buildings in the middle of the woods. Inside, some of the world's most important research is being done to find ways to control zebra and quagga mussel populations. This is the research department of the New York State Museum, or as research scientist Dan Malloy likes to call it, the little lab in the woods. 
After 20 years of painstaking research, his team of scientists have discovered a bacterium that's deadly to quagga and zebra mussels, but apparently harmless to the rest of the environment. We looked at little microbes in the environment, which by serendipity, if they're eaten by the pest, will kill the pest. That was the early 90s. Here we are, 2010, and that dream has come true. A commercial company in California is marketing the green formula under the name Zequinox. So it's got an excellent environmental track record from our lab data. And now it's time to try it as in the real world to actually control zebra and quagga mussels, not just little lab studies. And there's more on the horizon for this lab. They've discovered a parasite that appears to attack only zebra and quagga mussels. It literally eats away the interior connective tissue of the entire zebra mussel. But it could be a while before the parasite is on its way to a lake near you. Minimum of a decade. Why? Because that's how long it would take to do the kind of research to demonstrate its specificity to zebra mussels. Potentially something down the line that, that might control them might be a, a, a good thing for this river. Um, but for the time being, what we're trying to do is just gather as much data and information about uh, the zebra mussels that are here that we possibly can so that uh, one day we can use that um, hopefully to defend uh, against further spread. Coming up, invasive mussels have found their way out west, plus, what we can all do to help control the quagga invasion. Few things are more majestic than the birth of a new day on Lake Michigan. What's beautiful on the surface is not so pretty below. Zebra and quagga mussels are stealing the life out of the lake. We know that uh, yellow perch are in trouble in certain areas of the Great Lakes. Zebra mussels may be contributing to that. They may be contributing to the impacts on the whitefish population, and they may also be uh, impacting the lake trout populations, especially in Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, as well as uh, Lake Ontario. The invasive species are said to have arrived in the Great Lakes from Europe aboard ocean-going ships. But thousands of our inland lakes and rivers have been infected too. And ironically, the blame goes to those who value the lakes the most, recreational boaters and anglers who forgot or didn't know how to clean their boats when they moved from one body of water to another. Because it only takes one idiot. And if, if one person makes the mistake or doesn't care and, and transports two or more of the animals, one of each gender, then uh, it's over. If lake water is left in your boat and it looks clean, don't be fooled. When zebra mussels reproduce, they produce eggs that then are fertilized, and those uh, fertilized eggs then hatch into larvae. Those larvae are virtually invisible to the naked eye. There's about 100 zebra mussel larvae in this vial. Make sure that you don't move water of any kind from one body of water to another. Uh, that means the bait buckets and the live wells and anything else that might be contained in your, in your vessel. This is where the really important part is of the motor because this is where the cooling water is then uh, sucked into the motor to make sure that the motor uh, has proper circulation and is cooled while in operation. Unfortunately, this motor was overheated and destroyed because up in this cooling system, zero muscles have clogged the water intake. Now, after 20 years of exploding populations in the Great Lakes region, the quagga and zebra mussels have migrated west. The quagga mussel population was first found in Lake Mead in 2007 and quickly spread throughout the lower Colorado River system. It's moving upstream now in the Colorado. It's uh, colonizing all the reservoirs. It's, it's moving into reservoirs in Southern California. As the zebra mussel begins to spread, um, across the Mississippi, into the west now, down in the Colorado River that uh, feeds the aqueduct in the California for drinking water for San Diego and Los Angeles. The costs are going to be in the billions. And it's almost a more serious problem because water is moved so much in the west in aqueducts and other types of water conduits that now the West was fearing the invasion of zebra and quagga mussels. Starting in 2007, they realized they're here. And now, zebra and quagga mussels can be found in 20 states and hundreds of inland lakes. 
They also inhabit six major rivers in the United States. They leave a path of destruction in their wake that includes ecology changes to the water and the loss of millions of dollars to industry. It's just a matter of time before these insidious creatures find their way into a lake near you. If you see any of them as adults alive, you'll see many more of them soon. You have to do things differently. You just gotta figure out how to, how to, do, how to survive with them because you're not gonna get rid of them. And even though scientists at the New York Museum in Albany have found a substance that they hope will better control zebra and quagga mussels in the years ahead, the unfortunate reality will likely never change. You got them in your lake, they will always be in your lake. And hopefully in the meantime, uh, there's not a new invader that comes in and changes the equation again. One thing to remember about zebra and quagga mussel is that the larvae are small, microscopic, Leave a little water in your boat and you can transport thousands. To prevent the spread of these devastating invasive species, boaters and anglers must drain their boat before leaving the launch area. That includes your bilge, live well, and bait well if you have one, and the outboard's lower unit. And the best part, it's simple and it only takes a few seconds.